hello nice to see you today i am reading artemis bell uh, by ian colfer and today i will be reading chapter two which is titled translation by now you have guessed just how far artemis fell was prepared to go in order to achieve his goal but what exactly was this goal what outlandish scheme would involve the blackmailing of an alcohol addicted sprite the answer was gold Artemis's search had begun two years previously when he first became interested in surfing the internet. He quickly found the more arcane sites, alien abduction, UFO sightings, and the supernatural, but most specifically, the existence of the people. Traveling through gigabytes of data, he found hundreds of references to fairies from nearly every country in the world. Each civilization had its own terms for the people, but they were undoubtedly members of the same hidden family. Several stories mentioned a book carried by each fairy. It was their Bible, containing, as it allegedly did, the history of their race and the commandments that govern their extended lives. Of course, this book was written in Gnomish, the fairy language, and would be of no use to any human. Artemis believed that with today's technology, the book could be translated, and with this translation, you can begin to exploit a whole new group of creatures. Know thy enemy was Artemis's motto, so he immersed himself in the lore of the people until he had compiled a huge database on their characteristics, but it wasn't enough. So Artemis put out a call on the web. Irish businessmen will pay large amounts of U.S. dollars to meet a fairy sprite leprechaun pixie. The responses had been mostly fraudulent, but Ho Chi Minh City had finally paid off. Artemis was perhaps the only person alive who could take full advantage of his recent acquisition. He still retained a childlike belief in magic, tempered by an adult determination to exploit it. If there was anything capable, anybody capable of reliving the fairies of some of relieving the fairies of some of their magical gold, it was Artemis Fowl II. It was early morning before they reached Fowl Manor. Artemis was anxious to bring up the file on his computer, but first he decided to call in on Mother. Angeline Fowl was bedridden. She had been since her husband's disappearance. Nervous tension, the physician said. Nothing for it but rest and sleeping pills. That was almost a year ago. Butler's little sister, Juliet, was sitting at the foot of the stairs. Her gaze was boring a hole in the wall. Even the glitter mascara couldn't soften her expression. Artemis had seen that look already, just before Juliet had surplexed a particularly Im impudent pizza boy. The su suplex, Artemis gathered, was a wrestling move, an unusual obsession for a teenage girl. But then again, she was, after all, a butler. Problems, Juliet? Juliet straightened hurriedly. My own fault, Artemis. Apparently, I left a gap in the curtains. Mrs. Fowl couldn't sleep. Hmm, muttered Artemis, scaling the oak staircase slowly. He worried about his mother's condition. She hadn't seen the light of day in a long time now. Then again, should she miraculously recover, emerging revitalized from her bedchamber, it would single, sig signal the end of Artemis's own extraordinary freedom. It would be back off to school and no more spearheading criminal enterprises for you, my boy. He knocked gently on the arch double doors. Mother, are you awake? Something smashed against the side of the door. It sounded expensive. Of course I'm awake. How could I be sleeping in this blinding glare? Artemis ventured inside. An antique four-poster bed threw shadowy spires in the darkness, and a pear's pale sliver of light poked through a gap in the velvet curtains. Angeline Fowl sat hunched on her bed, her pale limbs growing white in the gloom. Artemis, darling, where have you been? Artemis sighed. She recognized him. That was a good sign. School trip, mother, skiing in Austria. Ah, skiing, crooned Angeline. How I miss it. Maybe when your father returns. Darling, could you close those wretched curtains? The light is intolerable. Of course, mother. Artemis felt his way across the room, wary of the low-level clothes chest scattered around the floor. Finally, his fingers curled around the velvet drapes. For a moment, he was tempted to throw them wide open, and then he sighed and closed the gap. Thank you, darling. By the way, we really have to get rid of that maid. She is good for absolutely nothing. Artemis held his tongue. Julia had been a hardworking and loyal member of the Fowl household for the past three years. Time to use Mother's absent-mindedness to his advantage. 
Oh, you're right, of course, Mother. I've been meaning to do it for some time. Butler has a sister I believe would be perfect for the position. I think I've mentioned her. Juliet? Angeline frowned. Juliet, yes. The name does seem familiar. Well, any won't be better than that silly girl we have now. When can she start? Straight away. I'll have Butler fetch her from the lodge. You're a good boy, Artemis. Now give Mummy a hug. Artemis stepped into the shadowy folds of his mother's robe. She smelled perfumed like petals and water, but her arms were cold and weak. Oh, darling, she whispered, and the sound sent goosebumps popping down Artemis's neck. I hear things at night. They crawl along the pillows and into my ears. Artemis felt that lump in his throat again. Perhaps we should open the curtains, mother. Oh, no, his mother sobbed, releasing him from her gasp. No, because then I could see them, too. Mother, please. But it was no use. Angeline was gone. She crawled to the far, far corner of her bed, pulling the quilt under her chin. Send the new girl. Yes, mother. Send her with cucumber slices and water. Yes, mother. Angelina glared at him with crafty eyes. And stop calling me mother. I don't know who you are, but you're certainly not my Artie. Artemis blinked back a few rebellious tears. Of course. Sorry, mother. Sorry. Hmm. Don't come back here again or I'll have my husband take care of you. He's a very important man, you know. Very well, Mrs. Fowle. This will be the last you see of me. It had better be. Angeline froze suddenly. Do you hear them? Artemis shook his head. No, I don't hear any. They're coming for me. They're everywhere. Angeline dived for cover beneath the bed clothes. Artemis could still hear her terrified sobs as she descended the marble staircase. The book was proving far more stubborn than Artemis had anticipated. It seemed to be almost actively resisting him. No matter which program he ran, ran it through, the computer came up blank. Artemis hard copied every page, tacking them to the walls of his study. Sometimes it helped to have things on paper. The script was like nothing he had seen before, and yet it was strangely familiar. Obviously a mixture of symbolic and character-based language, the text meandered around the page in no apparent order. What the program needed was some frame of reference, some central points on which to build. He separated all the characters and ran comparisons with English, Chinese, Greek, Arabic, and Cyrillic texts, even with Ogham. Nothing. Moody with frustration, Artemis sent Juliet scurrying when she interrupted with sandwiches and moved on to symbols. The most frequently reoccurring program was a small male figure. Or the most frequently reoccurring pictogram was a small male figure. Male, he presumed, though with the limited knowledge of the fairy anatomy, he supposed it could be female. A thought struck him. Artemis opened the ancient language file on his power translator and selected Egyptian. At last, a hit. The male symbol was remarkably similar to the Anubis god representation on Tutankhamun's inner chamber hieroglyphics. This was consistent with his other findings. The first written human stories were about fairies, suggesting that their civilization predated man's own. It would seem that Egyptians had simply adapted an existing scripture to suit their needs. There were other resemblances but the characters were just dissimilar enough to slip through the computer's net. This would have to be done manually. Each gnomish figure had to be enlarged, printed, and then compared with the hieroglyphics. Artemis felt the excitement of success thumping inside his ribcage. Almost every fairy pictogram or letter had an Egyptian counterpart. Most were universal, such as the sun or birds, but some seemed exclusively supernatural and had to be tailored to fit. The Anubis figure, for example, would make no sense as a dog god, so Artemis altered it to read King of the Fairies. By midnight, Artemis had successfully fed his findings into the Mac. All he had to do now was press decode. He did so. What emerged was a large, intricate string, string of meaningless gibberish. A normal child would have abandoned the task, task long since. The average adult would probably been have reduced to slapping the keyboard, but not Artemis. This book was testing him, and he would not allow it to win. The letters were right. He was certain of it. It was just the order that was wrong. Rubbing the sleep from his eyes, Artemis glared at the pages again. Each segment was borrowed by a solid was bordered by a solid line. This could represent paragraphs or chapters, but they were not meant to be read in the usual left to right, top to bottom fashion. Artemis experimented. He tried the Arabic right to left and the Chinese columns. Nothing worked. 
Then he noticed that each page had one thing in common, a central section. The other pictograms were arranged around this pivotal area. So a central starting point, perhaps. But where to go from there? Artemis scanned the pages from some other common factor. After several minutes, he found it. There was on each page a tiny spearhead in the corner of one section. Could this be an arrow, a direction, go this way? So the theory would be start in the middle, then follow the arrow reading in spirals. The computer program wasn't built to handle something like this. So Artemis had to improvise. With a craft knife and ruler, he dissected the first page of the book and resembled it in a traditional Western language order, left to right parallel rows. And then he rescanned the page and fed it through the modified Egyptian translator. And if you look here, you can see what it looks like, what Artemis did. The computer hummed and whirled, converting the information to binary. Several times it stopped to ask for confirmation of a character or symbol. This happened less and less as the machine learned the new language. Eventually, two words flashed across the screen. File converted. Fingers shaking from exhaustion and excitement, Artemis clicked print. A single page scrolled from the laser writer. It was in English now. Yes, there were mistakes, some fine tuning needed, but it was perfectly legible and, more importantly, perfectly understandable. Fully aware that he was probably the first human in several thousand years to decode the magical words, Artemis switched on his desk light and began to read. The book of the people being instructions to our magics and life rules. Carry me always, carry me well. I am thy teacher of herb and spell. I am thy link to power arcane. Forget me and thy magic shall wane. Ten times, ten commandments there be. They will answer every mystery. Curses, curses, alchemy. These secrets shall be thine through me. But fairy, remember this above all. I am not for those in mud that crawl. And forever doom shall be the one who betrays my secrets one by one. Artemis could hear the blood pumping in his ears. He had them. They would be ants beneath his feet. Their every secret would be laid bare by technology. Suddenly, the exhaustion claimed him, and he sat, sank back in his chair. There was so much yet to complete, 43 pages to be translated for a start. He pressed the intercom button that linked him to the speakers all over the house. Butler, get Juliet and come up here. There are some jigsaws I need you to assemble. Perhaps a little family history would be useful at this point. The Files were indeed legendary criminals. For generations, they skirmished on the wrong side of the law, hoarding enough funds to become legitimate. Of course, once they were legitimate, they found it not to their liking and returned almost immediately to crime. It was Artemis I, our subject's father, who had thrown the family fortune into jeopardy. With the breakup of communist Russia, Artemis Sr. had decided to invest a huge chunk of the foul, foul fortune in establishing new shipping lanes to the vast continent. New consumers, were, he reasoned, would need new consumer goods. The Russian mafia did not take too kindly to a Westerner muscling in on their market and so decided to send a little message. The message took the form of a stolen missile launched at the foul star on her way past Murmansk. Artemis Sr. was on board the ship along with Butler's uncle and 250,000 cans of cola. It was quite an explosion. The Fowls were not left destitute, far from it, but billionaire status was no longer theirs. Artemis II vowed to remedy this. He would restore the family fortune and he would do it in his own unique fashion. Once the book was translated, Artemis could begin planning in earnest. He already knew what the ultimate goal was. Now he could figure out how to achieve it. Gold, of course, was the objective, the acquisition of gold. It seemed that the people were almost as fond of the precious metal as humans. Each fairy had its own cachet, but not for much longer if Artemis had his way. There would be at least one of the fairy folk wandering around with empty pockets by the time he'd finished. After 18 solid hours of sleep and light continental breakfast, Artemis climbed to the study that he had inherited from his father. It was a traditional enough room, dark oak, floor-to-ceiling shelving, but Artemis had jammed it with the latest computer technology. A series of networked Apple Macs whirled from various corners of the room. One was running CNN's website through a DAT projector, throwing oversized current affair images against the, black, the back wall. Butler was, all, was there already, firing up the hard drives. Shut them all down except the book. I need quiet for this. The manservant started. 
The CNN site had been running for almost a year. Artemis was convinced that news of his father's rescue would come from there. Shutting it down meant that he was finally letting go. All of them? Artemis glanced at the back wall for a moment. Yes, he said finally, all of them. Butler took the liberty of patting his employer gently on the shoulder just once before returning to work. Artemis cracked his knuckles. Time to do what he did best. Plot dastardly acts. And that ends chapter two. Thank you for listening and we'll be back tomorrow with chapter three. Bye.